Vipassana retreat. And I learned uh, Vipassana meditation from a teacher called S.N. Goenka. And um, it completely blew my mind and, and changed my life. And ever since that first course, I, I do two hours of Vipassana meditation every day. I usually mm. start my work day with one hour of meditation and I finish it with another hour of meditation. And every year, like my yearly vacation is to go for a long retreat of between 30 and 60 days of just meditation in complete silence, no, no emails, no computers, no books, no reading, writing, nothing, just, just meditating. Oh, that's wonderful. I am envious. Do you have kids? Uh, no, just dogs. Uh, <laughs> explains a lot. That explains your freedom. Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful. So just to give people a clearer picture of what you're up to there. So Goenka is a very famous Vipassana teacher. There, there are two strands of Vipassana that have been very influential, particularly in the West, among all the, the Westerners who in, in the 60s discovered this practice. And they both come out of Burma. And Goenka is one line coming from a teacher named Uba Kin. And there was another line that came from a teacher named Mahasi Sayadaw. And so all of the Vipassana practice I've done on retreat has come from the, the Mahasi Sayadaw line, which teaches the same kind of mindfulness, but it's a different sort of practice. I mean, I think the technical details are, are less important. The key is just to observe reality as it is every moment just to stay focused what is really happening right now as against all the stories and explanations that, that our mind constantly generates. And this is extremely difficult. Uh, what struck me in my first course, I remember that, like the first day I came to the retreat, I was absolutely um, amazed by it, that they, it starts with a very simple practice, sounds simple anyway, of you just have to focus your attention on the breath and uh, observe when the breath is coming in and when the breath is going out of your nostrils. That's it. You don't have to do anything. Just, just ob ob observe that. And I couldn't do it for more than like five seconds or 10 seconds. And my mind would run away somewhere. Yeah. And you know, I was 24 at the time. And it was the first time I realized how little I understand my mind, how little control I have over my attention. And this is why they start with this very simple practice, just focus on the breath because it's so difficult. And once you get the hang of that and you can do it for more than 10 seconds, then yes, the, 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 the idea or the instruction is to start observing not just the breath, but everything that is happening in the body um, sensations throughout the body. In every part of the body, there is some sensation at, at any moment. And um, you start observing that, and you see the deep connection between these sensations and what's happening in your mind. That we think that we react to events in the outside world, to memories from our childhood, to something we saw on television. But in fact, in each and every moment, we constantly react to the sensations within our body. And, and everything people do, as a historian, I can say that everything people do, you know, from fidgeting in your chair to starting a world war, um, you're actually reacting to sensations in your body. It's amazing how out of control our minds are and how few people realize that their minds are out of control and, and the consequences of their of them being out of control are, as you say, these are the same process that, that gets you to say something untoward in a personal interaction is the very process that brings us, you know, civilizational scale catastrophes, wars and all the rest. People are being moved by their thoughts in every moment and they see no alternative. And meditation is, for the most part, the one way people can become more aware of these processes that rule their lives. Had you had any psychedelic experiences or anything that got you to go on that first retreat, or how did you find yourself there? No, I had a very good friend. He's still a good friend of mine. He now works in Silicon Valley. And he, for an entire year, kept like nudging me, you should go to a ret retreat. And he was very persistent. And um, I was at a time in life that... I had all these big questions and I had no answers and I was very disappointed 
with the university, with the uh, academic world, with, um, uh, with my studies, because they didn't provide me any answers to the really deep questions of, um, you know, the, the, the suffering in the world and the suffering in my life. Where is it coming from and what can we do about it? And he kept telling me, you know, you should go to a meditation retreat. Maybe it will show you something. And, and I just kept reading books and uh, reading articles. And I was convinced that the answer will come from there until I reached a, a certain degree of desperation. And I said, okay, what can I lose from going to this 10 days meditation retreat? And I, I never looked back since. Mm. And have you done any psychedelics since, or is that something that you haven't experienced? As a student, I, I did, uh, what was it, um, ecstasy, but um, it, you know, it was an interesting experience, but it didn't teach me anything really <laughs> valuable. And later on, I, I realized, I mean, the really, I think, the dangerous, the dangerous potential of all the psychedelic drugs is that people get hooked on the excitement and that they want special experiences. Yeah. And this is also dangerous sometimes in meditation that people come to a meditation retreat and they want something special. They want to experience, I don't know, bliss and, and to fly in the air and to see stars and whatever. And then you come to the retreat, at least in Vipassana, and they tell you, okay, observe your breath. And then you have a pain in your back and they say, oh, good, you have pain. Observe the pain. Look, look just for once in your life, instead of reacting to the pain, just see how does pain feel? Or maybe it's very hot. And they tell you, okay, observe the heat. How does it feel? How does the heat feel? Or how does boredom feel? And people say, I don't want to observe boredom or pain. I want these special, wonderful experiences. And it's the same with psychedelic drugs. I think that the, they, they can open your mind to some levels of reality, which are usually hidden from us. But the danger is that uh, people just want the next trip and the next special experience. And in the, in the end, I think the real key is to understand the normal everyday experiences and not the unique once in the in, once in a lifetime special experience, because if you want to deal with your anger or boredom or irritation or anything, then you need to observe your anger, and um, it's very difficult if you're just pursuing special special experiences. Yeah, that's a very important point, and I fully agree with it. The illusion that gets introduced when you're using psychedelics in that way to have more peak experiences. As you say, you can use meditation that way, where you, the moment you feel a little bliss or rapture or some very positive, unusual mental state, you can take that to be the signature of a successful meditation. And the illusion that creeps in there, which is of a piece with everyone's efforts to seek happiness throughout their lives, is that experience has to change in order for the most profound things about the human mind or human consciousness can be discovered. Profundity is elsewhere, which is, in fact, not the case. I mean, if the ego is an illusion, as it turns out it is, you can discover that coincident with the most ordinary moments of consciousness. You don't need the full fireworks show of a psychedelic experience to notice that there's a subject-object illusion that can be penetrated, and that's something that you do get with a very systematic approach to mindfulness meditation in this mm -hmm. case. It's wonderful you're doing that. Has meditation affected the way you approach your work? I believe I detect the, the influence in, in many of the things you've written, but how do, how do you view that? Yes, it has a very deep influence, both on, on my ability um, to research and to write such books, because especially when you deal with something like the history of the world in one book, the one thing you need above all else is the ability to focus. Uh, what's really important and how not to get bogged down in the thousand little details and, and you know all the kings and battles and dates and all that. And the practice of meditation, I think, gave me this ability to remain focused. And without that, I, I couldn't have written Sapiens or, or Homo Deus. And on, on another level, 
um, at least Vipassana is really about observing reality as it is and being able to distinguish between what is real and what is just a story or a fantasy created by our own minds. And this had a very deep impact on my interpretation of history uh, because also when I look at history, for me, the big question is what is real and what are fictions created by human beings? And at least my understanding is that the source of human power, but also the source of so much human misery, is um, the human imagination and the ability of humans to create fictional stories and then to believe them to such an extent that they can start entire wars just because they believe some religious or national or economic fiction. Mm. And um, this is really what gave us control of the planet. We control this planet not because as individuals we are much more intelligent than chimpanzees or pigs or dogs, but rather because we are the only mammal that can cooperate in very large numbers. And we can do that because we believe in fictions. If you examine any large-scale human cooperation, you always find a fictional story at the, at the basis, whether it's about God or the nation or money or even human rights. Uh, human rights, like God in heaven, they are just a story invented by humans. They are not a biological reality. And um, this is, again, the source of, of our power and also of many of our calamities. You can never convince a group of chimpanzees to attack the neighboring group by promising them that after they die, if they die for the great chimpanzee god or the great chimpanzee nation, then after they die, they will go to chimpanzee heaven and there receive lots of bananas and virgin chimpanzees and, and things like that. No chimpanzee will ever, ever believe such a story. Uh, and this is why we control the world and not the chimpanzees. I love this basic picture, but I, I must admit I've had a few problems with some of your terminology here because you you use words like religion and fiction and stories fairly loosely. So you say things like, yeah. you know, science depends on religion and humanism is a religion and, you know, all, as you just said, all large-scale human cooperation is based on fiction. But it seems to me that there are fictions and then there are fictions. And, and I think we still want to differentiate between stories and concepts that are obviously false, right, and therefore spread confusion by definition, and those that one need not be confused to adopt. So, you know, the U.S. Constitution or the concept of human rights or the convention of money, these are, are not fictions in the same way that the concept of paradise or martyrdom or the Holy Spirit are fictions. And I mean, I don't have to be confused about the nature of reality to see the benefit of thinking in terms of human rights or to use money. Do you disagree with that or, or are we on the same no, page there? I, I definitely agree that not all stories are the same and some stories are, are much more beneficial than other stories. And also they demand a kind of different kind maybe of belief. But what happens is even if you start by a convention like money, that yes, everybody knows that uh, these pieces of paper have no value and it's just an agreement between people that uh, invest them with a certain value. Very soon what happens is um, that people forget that or ignore that. And if you open a suitcase full of $100 bills, and you look at the brain of the person mm. who is looking at that, at that pile of money, you see like all the neurons going crazy. And the person sees the money as something really valuable. Now, if you start talking with him and, you know, you have a long philosophical discussion, then yes, in the end, maybe he will agree that, ah, actually, it's just a convention. But the immediate experience of the person looking at the pile of money is, you know, immense greed and even a willingness to kill for it. And uh, it's the same, you know, with corporations. If you tell somebody that, you know, Google is just a story or uh, uh, General Motors is just a story, then yes, if you sit for a long 
philosophical discussion or legal discussion, they will understand what you mean. But in most cases, in everyday experience, we treat these entities as if they are completely real. Yeah. It's also worth pointing out that we can get locked in to these conventions in ways that create an immense amount of needless suffering. And you must know Alan Watts, the great popularizer of Eastern philosophy from the, the 60s yeah. and 70s. He told a, an amusing story. I'm sure he told this a hundred times, but he, when he's talking about the Great Depression in this vein and talking about the, the concept of money, he pointed out that money is an abstraction, kind of like an inch, right, or any unit of measurement. And so the way our economy fell into the, the abyss after the Great Depression was, to some degree, a matter of our not being able to free ourselves from this convention. And, and so he talked about, you know, what happened in the Great Depression was like a construction worker showing up on the job, and the foreman says, sorry, no more work today, we've run out of inches, right? And the idea of running out of money when there's still houses to be built and still people who want them, and there was no less work to be done, but we couldn't coordinate our work given what had happened to the economy. These abstractions obviously have enormous power. Yeah, and, and also I would say that if you would talk with, uh, you know, like a theologian, then he will tell you, well, I also, we, we also know that God is not this old man, old angry man in the sky that gets upset if you, if, if, I don't know, if, if you don't uh, follow his orders. God is, is, is love, God is whatever. And he will come up with some very abstract and maybe convincing story about what God is. And when you hear this story of the theologian, you will say, well, actually, maybe I was too fast to condemn religion. But as a historian, I will tell you, yes, uh, the theologian's God, uh, this, is, this is maybe kind of a nice, uh, um, not nice, but th this idea has some sense in it. But this is not the God of history. This is not the God mm. that launched the Crusades and the Jihads and all the religious wars and persecutions and, and so forth. There is a huge gap between the God of the theologians and the God of the masses. And it's for his, from a historical perspective, it's the God of the masses that really counts. It's the angry man in the sky. And it's the same with, with money. Yes, if, if, if we have this deep conversation, then we all agree that money is just an abstraction created by humans and so forth. But uh, I don't know, if you're, if you're in the middle of a warfare between two, two gangs or between two corporations, then everybody's dead serious that these pieces of paper or these electronic data on the computer, this is the most important thing in the world.